there is a trend developing across the province that's seeing municipalities move away from the traditional project tenders for municipal infrastructure projects and towards other more opaque models, uh, such as RFP, NRFP, RFQ, and the like. The early experience of contractors has been, at best, mixed because there's very little communication going on on the different sets of rules that govern owners and contractors under these models. And for contractors that have historically bid on tenders, the rules governing these models can seem both difficult to interpret and perhaps even unfair. If nothing else, this summary is meant to highlight some of the different rules that apply to non-tender contract models, and it's meant to encourage you to read the terms and conditions in the project call to help you determine what rules apply regardless of what the project documents list as the procurement method. Namely, whether the intent is to establish a contract A binding contract upon the submission of bids, or simply an invitation to negotiate a deal with whomever the owner prefers. The most important thing for a contractor to understand is the legal difference between a contractual relationship and an invitation to treat. A contractual relationship is your typical tender process, or when contract A, contract B applies. It's entered into when an offer is made by one party and accepted by the other. So your contract A is the bidding contract, which arises when a bidder submits a bid to an owner's project call. The tender call is the offer in this situation, and the submission of a bid consistent with the terms of the tender is the acceptance. When the owner turns around and chooses one of the bids, that bid then becomes the offer for contract B, the construction contract itself, and the owner's selection of a bid becomes the acceptance, which creates contract B. This has been the traditional contract model for decades. An invitation to treat resembles an offer, but is materially different. In this case, an owner can invite others to negotiate a deal. Companies may respond with offers, which the owner is then free to accept or not accept. This type of invitation has no legal significance and no contract is formed until the owner accepts an offer, which is not required to be the lowest bid. Reading the terms and conditions of a contract is critically important to determine whether a contractual relationship or an invitation to treat exists. A contract document may be listed as an RFT, RFP, RFQ, however this often misrepresents what the language in the terms and conditions actually defines the document as. This is so important because the implications for bidding on a contract A binding document versus a non-contract A document cannot be understated. There are much different duties and rules which apply to owners and bidders which could render you powerless or powerful depending on the type of project call and what you know about the duties that apply. Bidding on a non-contract A project provides a completely different set of rules than a traditional contract A binding document. So when does a contract A apply? Well, if the project documents support a yes answer to the highlighted questions on the slide, then it likely is that a contract A applies. Increasingly though, language is being included in project documents that make determining whether a contract A applies or not very difficult. For example, including most but not all of that information above uh, is something that we see more and more of. If the outcome for the successful bidder is a construction contract, then the project call will likely be found to give rise to contract A. But if it's merely a right to negotiate a deal, then a contract A is much less likely to have been found to arise. So what are the owner's obligations for contract B? Well, they're listed on the slide here, and it basically requires that an owner treats all bidders fairly and equally, which includes all of the criteria noted here. But an invitation to treat is not beholden to all of these rules above. So it may give the impression of being unfair. There are advantages to both the owner and the contractor in this more murky model, though, which is why it's so important to understand what rules are applying to the bids that you're submitting. In the increasingly common situation where contract A, contract B does not apply on a municipal tender, and instead the contract is an invitation to treat, well, there are advantages to both sides. For the owner, the obligations normally found in a contract A tender are avoided and risks arising from any alleged breach of those obligations are reduced. 
For example, an owner is not required to award a job to the low bidder and may accept later non-compliant bids. They may disqualify a bidder for past transgressions that are unrelated to performance. And bidders may have no legal recourse if the owner engages in what they deem to be unfair conduct under the rules that would govern a traditional contract A procurement. So while this does sound all pretty one-sided, it is important to know that it's not all unicorns and rainbows for municipalities when it comes to issuing contracts under these models. The risk for them is that contractors are not required to hold their bid price. You can withdraw your price at any time prior to the actual acceptance of a contract for any reason. Let me explain. If a municipality issues a contract that includes certain contract A obligations for the bidder, things like bid irrevocability, but it also includes language that reserves their right to accept any bid even if it's not compliant or gives them the opportunity to negotiate with the bidders, then a contract A is likely not established. And in releasing a document like this, they've created a lot of uncertainty around what rules are applying, what duties exist for both parties, and what tools you as the bidder have at your disposal. They're trying to get the best of both worlds, but in reality, they can't have it. If a contractor knows the tender call is an invitation to treat, regardless of how it's actually listed, and there is no contract A, then you can withdraw your bid before it's accepted. So if you realize you've made an error in your bid price, no longer do you have to carry such a significant burden. This type of uncertainty creates a lot of risk. So bidders may simply start refusing to bid or their prices may actually account for the risk of dealing with an owner that they deem to be unfair in the evaluation of the bids. In a busy marketplace, they may just choose to allocate their bidding resources to other projects where the certainty of contract A rules apply. Or they may just spend less time and effort in preparing well thought out and competitive bids under an RFQ. There's a lot of unfamiliarity in the marketplace around these type of procurement models and they're becoming increasingly common. So it's important to know what rules apply and what your rights are in these situations. And if you need any help, please check out our website or reach out to our office at any time for more information.